All right, friends, we have Tiffany Yu here with us today, founder of Diversibility, and her case study is a kickoff to a two-part back-to-back episode series where we are going to talk about the business model of being a creator, being an influencer. And what's really awesome about today's case study is Tiffany's full-time business is not being a content creator or influencer per se, but she's still been able to make more than six figures through doing content essentially as a side hustle. So we'll get into the details in just a moment. But first, Tiffany, I'd love to ask you, what is your cubicle to CEO story? Mm. The short version is that I got fired. Um, But the longer version is that I graduated in 2010, which was a couple years after the 08 recession. But even with all of that, the most attractive jobs to get at the time were either in investment banking or consulting. And my funny story, or my it's funny to me, is that my freshman year, I was taking an accounting 101 class, my freshman year of college, and my balance sheet balanced, and I was like so excited. And then I just knew I wanted to like stay in, fin- in finance. So I got a job at Goldman. I was there for a few years, healthcare investment banking. And then my third year there, I decided to participate in a program they had called Mobility. And it just meant that they wanted to keep you at the bank, but if you wanted to try out a different part of the bank, you could. So I actually made a non-traditional move and I moved to campus recruiting. Hmm. And so here I was, a banker turned recruiter. That was the first transition. And then at the end of my time as a recruiter, I loved, you know, getting to focus on the pipeline of students that we could introduce to careers in financial services. There was so much that I learned in the two years. I'm I'm an ex-banker that you'll meet who actually appreciated my time in investment banking. I don't have very many negative things to say. Uh, but after that, I decided I wanted to pursue a childhood dream of broadcast journalism. I had always admired Ellen DeGeneres and Katie Couric growing up, and I kind of just wanted to know what that life was like. So I ended up getting a job as a production assistant, working from the bottom. I was a contractor, an attempt to perm roll at Bloomberg Television. So took the financial knowledge that I knew, transitioned and pivoted that over to the media world. And after a few years there, uh, so many pivots in the in the in the cubicle <laughs> on the cubicle side of things. But after about a year there, I ended up getting poached to come back into finance. But this time within a music startup that was co-founded by P Diddy, which was pretty cool. I got to sit in on board meetings. He was the chairman of the board. Um, I managed all of our kind of like investor relations. I reported to the CFO. On paper, it was everything that like the lean in version of Tiffany wanted, my own office, director level title, reporting, sitting in on board meetings. And then after a little bit of a winding road, got a role at a startup, was there for six months and then got fired and told Mm -hmm. myself that I would try out this diversibility thing, which had started out as a university club, was a side hustle, kind of like a meetup group for a while. Would try that out. And now my my I got fired date was actually March 3rd, 2017. So now we are approaching six plus years. Wow. Well, happy, happy uh fire anniversary. <laughs> Can we make that a thing? <laughs> well, I, I actually do think we should make it a thing because I think there's so much shame surrounding the experience of getting laid off or getting fired. And for a period of time, I didn't tell anyone because I felt shame. And then I'm like, how am I supposed to find my next opportunity or my next job if I'm not letting people know that I'm looking and that I'm available? You know, as we're having this conversation in real time, I just had a a light bulb go off in my head. So I, I have to credit you if this ever comes to fruition. But I feel like there should be some sort of virtual summit or virtual event where we can bring on a a group of panelists, all who have been laid off or fired at some point and turn that into their, their next big pivot or their next big thing that really was kind of meant to be their life's work. It's funny when you started off your story with, well, the short of it is that I got fired. I was laughing. If you were, if you're watching this on YouTube, you'll, you'll see my face do that. But it was because this morning I actually, Tiffany, I actually just interviewed another podcast guest who literally almost verbatim answer that the same way. She was like, well, in short, I got fired. And so mm-hmm. <laughs> clear, clearly you are not the only one. Um, that's a really interesting story. And it's interesting, especially to me, because I 
also wanted to be in broadcast journalism um, as a childhood dream. Someday still, I would love to host a daytime television talk show. I think that would be my ultimate dream. But hearing all of these paths that you had to take before you really landed in your role of taking what started out, like you said, as a club into a full-on organization and and all the advocacy work that you do now for anti-ableism is just very inspiring. So we'll get again into a little bit more of your advocacy work at the end of this conversation, but for today's case study, so you run Diversibility, but you also have this side hustle as a content creator. And I know that term can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. In your purview, how how do you think of your content creation side business? Like, how would you define that? Yeah, I actually see it as an extension of my advocacy. So one part of this story that I haven't really shared is that those first couple of years after getting fired and exploring this full-time diversibility slash disability advocacy work was I... I was a very scrappy entrepreneur. I was Airbnb out my bedroom when I was traveling. You know, shout out to the the gig economy. Yeah. Um, I was being an extra in commercials. I was selling jewelry. Like I was doing so many different things because a lot of advocacy work pays zero dollars. Mm. And so when so many of us found our way online in 2020, I was like, if everyone's going on to social media, I'm going to go on to social media too. But I, I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge that in 2019, I think that's when I got my first my first significant brand deal. Mm-hmm. It was for $5,000. I had maybe like 5,000 Instagram followers at the time, but my audience is so niche. Uh, mm-hmm. Or maybe not that, or hopeful, the hope is that it doesn't become that niche, right? Being a disabled Asian woman, uh, hopefully there are more of us creating content. But yeah, I, I see it as an extension of my advocacy, but also a place where I can go to expand my creative outlets and have fun. So I have noticed that over the last couple of years, I've kind of de-niched or unniched. I don't know what the version, you know, there's kind of like a de-influencing trend right now. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and And in the beginning, it was all here's disability advocacy content or like, here's how I navigate life as someone who has a paralyzed arm. That's one of the disabilities that I have. Or here's what it's like to live with PTSD. And and now my content's like, hey, here's a cool event that I went to. And I just want to share it because I this is my video diary in a way. So I mm-hmm. think that making sure that I'm pairing that title content creator with having fun and being able to document parts of my life and share that with other people has been important for for my mental health as a creator and, and to have some balance. Absolutely. And I want to circle back to that very first deal that you ever landed or first significant deal, as you said, in 2019 on Instagram. But before I do that, I typically wouldn't ask a question that you can Google because the whole point of our show is to ask successful entrepreneurs the questions you can't Google. But I feel like for the sake of our listeners, it would be helpful to have a little bit of context. So maybe the 30 second version of, you know, you you kind of already teased it a little bit. You have, obviously you live with disabilities, um, but tell us your story that really launched this whole mission of yours, this life purpose of yours. Yeah. So daughter of a Taiwanese immigrant and a refugee from the Vietnam War, that will make sense soon. (laughs) Uh, And at the age of nine, I was involved in a car accident. My dad was driving. He unfortunately passed away. I acquired a slew of injuries, including breaking a couple bones in one of my legs. That would leave me in a wheelchair for four months. Broken bones do heal, or hopefully the majority of them heal. And I also acquired a permanent nerve injury on my right arm known as a brachial plexus injury. The easiest way to understand is that my arm is paralyzed. And in the years that followed, as the daughter of Asian immigrants, it was instilled in me not to share anything that might be seen as shameful. That could even include the firing. Uh, And so the car accident was seen as shameful. The fact that my dad passed away, the fact that I now had a visible apparent disability And sometimes people will come and be like, well, what's the whole deal? Why are they shameful? And in my cultural upbringing, anything like that made it seem like our family had bad luck and it would make other families not want to associate with us for fear that we would rub our bad luck off onto people rather than this was some isolated, random series of events. So for 12 years, I didn't tell anyone about the car accident, which is actually what I actually think exacerbated my PTSD. 
But I told everyone my dad was away on a trip. People assumed my injury was from birth. People just made a lot of assumptions. And it made me realize that by not owning my own story, I was not only keeping track of a lot of lies, but I was also letting a lot of other people define what my story was. So that turning point in 2009, creating this disability club at Georgetown was really, I want to share my story in the most truthful way in, in my version of this truth. And I wonder if other people like me are looking for a platform or a way to know that their stories matter too. And maybe it will provide possibility or empowerment or motivation for other people that the greatest gift is just by being yourself. Um, yeah. And that's actually something that I've translated to my content too. That wasn't 30 seconds, I apologize, but I tried to make oh, it as brief no. as possible. No, that, I mean, it was extremely succinct. I, it is hard to take such a powerful, big story and put it into so few words. And I'm I'm sitting here so inspired. And I mean, I, I would love to spend, you know, hour plus talking to you just about that side of the story. Unfortunately, of course, we don't have that space today. But for those of you listening, if this is your first introduction into Tiffany's world and her advocacy work at Diversibility, please do not leave this episode without taking the time to actually Google Diversibility, Google Tiffany Yu, and learn more about the story that you know she just previewed because it is it is so powerful. And I did not experience something physically traumatic like losing a parent at such a young age, Tiffany, but I can absolutely relate from the cultural standpoint of wanting to uh, – a facade isn't the right word – that I'm looking for, but I, I understand what you mean. Um, you know, in Asian culture and Chinese culture, Taiwanese culture, it is very important that your place in society is very much viewed by how how others perceive your your family. And there's so much intergenerational, I think, shame or secrecy that can be passed on because you want to make sure that everything looks golden on the outside, right? And and I think that you breaking the barriers um, of that. That trauma and allowing others to feel seen by your story is incredibly brave and just something I truly admire. So thank you for giving us that extra context. Thank you. And if your listeners want to Google it, I think I think it's called Saving Face. Um, okay. Have you heard about that? No, I haven't. Oh, no. okay. Another, another podcast. But um, but in Mandarin, there's a phrase called Dio Lian, which means to lose face. Yes. Mm -hmm. But um, but I actually didn't learn Mandarin growing up, so I don't know what the saving face version <laughs> of, of it is. But but I it was pretty much just like you don't want to lose face, which means you did something embarrassing, you did something shameful that makes you lose your reputation, and all you, everything you want to do is to save your face and to save your family's face. Yes. Okay. When you said, "Are you familiar with Safe Face?" I thought you meant like as a as an like an organization or some sort okay. of movement. But no, now that you say Julian, yeah, I completely understand what you're saying because my my mom used to say stuff like that to me all the time. Like it is absolutely about, uh, like you said, just making sure again that your reputation is intact and and whole for strangers or for the public. So, yes, definitely Google Tiffany's story when you have the time and. Let's go back real quick, Tiffany, to the case study. So your first Instagram deal was when you had 5,000 followers. Tell us about how that deal came about. Who was it with? Uh, was this an inbound request? Was this something you pitched? And I think that's really encouraging too for a lot of people to hear that you didn't have this massive following when you were able to land this $5,000 deal. So I would love the details around this. Yeah. I don't know if I can name names, but I will describe the initiative. <laughs> um, <Right. Cool. laughs> so it was actually an Instagram and Twitter deal. It was an inbound. Mm -hmm. um, and I will say that what has been kind of unique to me is that the majority of the deals that I've done have been inbounds. And I feel really grateful that I had so many cubicle experiences because it made my network very broad and very wide, right? I've got my broadcast journalism friends who now are at other companies. I've got my finance friends who now are also at other companies. And my hope is that they think of me if they realize they have budget for something down the line. But this was an inbound. And it was a campaign that was looking for people to sign a pledge, making a commitment to diversity, equity, and inclusion. Hmm. And so what I actually really like was I feel like it was like ahead of its time. I mean, 2019, wow. <laughs> you know? Yes. Um, <laughs> And, and so honestly, I didn't know what to charge. I had about 10,000 total followers at the time. And 
Across all platforms, just to clarify. Across the two platforms that they were thinking about. So 5,000 on Instagram and 5,000 on Twitter. Okay. And I think they were looking for, they were looking for one static post. I know now you have to go into like all the, all the things. One static post, one set of stories, and two tweets. Mm. And when they originally came to me, they said something along the lines of, like, oh, we have $3,500 to spend for this. And keep in mind, you know, when I graduated from college, I was making six figures. Like I I had a very different view of, of money. But growing up the daughter of Asian immigrants, I think I, I also grew up in like a scarcity mindset about money. But I said, how much would this be worth for me to take time away from the advocacy work that I'm doing to go take a photo and write a caption and draft up some tweets? So they had already given me a number, which was 35. And I went back and I said, I can do this for 5,000. And they said, okay. And then what was interesting was after the campaign went live, I actually went and I looked at the other creators. I don't call myself an influencer, but some people do. I went and looked at the other people that they had as part of the campaign. And I actually wondered if I had undersold myself. I didn't know anything about pricing. But now looking back, I realized that was a pretty good deal. But also, again, my audience is very niche, right? And at the time, and probably still, a lot of people aren't thinking about disability through a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens. And a lot of these brands, especially for this specific campaign, was probably thinking, how do we make sure we are encompassing all the different aspects of diversity in who we're selecting to amplify this campaign? Absolutely. The the context that you provided, by the way, extremely helpful. I am so in awe that you had the- uh, Audacity. Just, not even audacity, the foresight to, on your very first deal, not just take exactly what was offered to you. I think that is so rare in not only the creator industry, really any, I mean, if you think about anyone, um, you know, your first client, your first uh, brand deal, even heck your first salary, your first job offer, right? It's so easy, especially as women for us to just take what is given and say, oh, thank you so much. Like we don't want to rock the boat um, by coming across, again, you mentioned the term saving face, um, kind of that same lens of, I think a lot of us women, we sometimes feel this innate need to people please by not coming across as selfish or greedy or whatever it is by asking more than what we were given. And so I I just want to applaud you for that because that's that's rare and that's really cool to see. And I'm glad that they said yes. And it's funny looking back, like you said, that you may have probably even had the the ability to ask for more. I am curious these days when you're looking at pricing deliverables, how do you look at pricing those deliverables now that you have more experience in your back pocket with working with brands? Yeah. So the full disclosure I will give here is that starting in, I want to say the fall of 2021, I started working with an influencer manager. Mm, okay. So okay. they are the ones who help help with my deals. But again, I kind of think back to if that was the threshold. So pri- pricing is so it's so hard because no matter who you talk to, they won't be transparent. And they'll <laughs> say, well, it depends, number of followers. And so there's a, actually a really great platform called Clara for Creators. I love that. Yeah. It's a good Have one. Have you heard of it? Okay, great. So that. there are there are now a couple out there, but Clara is the one that I use. And I'll share an example. So there was a pretty well known brand, another social media platform, and they were looking to do a deal and they offered fourteen hundred dollars, one four zero zero. And that's well below anything I had done, but I went on to Clara and I looked people who had larger followings than me we're all doing deals at that rate. And I said, maybe they probably only budgeted this amount. And because of because I want to add this to my portfolio, I'm willing to do it for that. Mm-hmm. So I think it depends. I always go in starting with, hey, what budget are you working with? And I will say one piece of advice that I got early on that was helpful for me, because there are so many aspects of the deal that I don't think I have the knowledge around. This is why I appreciate having a rep, because like exclusivity, like whitelisting, like being able to use your content in their ads, like all of that you can put a price on. So I will share that one piece of advice that I got 
was to itemize all of your digital assets and put a price on them. Like literally every digital asset. So how much is a set of three Instagram stories? Is one static in feed post? Is a link in bio? Is an Instagram reel? Is a pinned post? Is a Instagram reel on feed? You know, so I mean, I was just taking Instagram as, as an example. There are so many digital parts having a link in the story, you know, like I just named off like so many different things that you can put a price on. And when I itemized it all out, then I put prices with each of them so that I knew ballpark and I didn't plan on really sharing that rate card with anyone, but just so I knew for my own internal barometer that if someone is asking to do an Instagram stories with a post, here's how much total it would be together. Here's how much I'd be willing to package it for. We follow a very similar model, and I'm I'm so glad you shared that that level of itemization is not so that you can, like you said, share with the brand, like, here's my a la carte spread of every possible thing I could offer you. You take your pick, but rather giving you confidence to kind of at a glance gauge, does this budget range feel aligned with what I think my work or this distribution or access to my audience is worth, right? In the link in bio, I'm so glad you said that one because that one, I bet, especially for new creators, is not something they even thought could be like an added asset or deliverable. Just like putting someone's link in your bio is an additional cost because it is an additional place for visibility and for more importantly, for action, for click-through rates, right? And so um, each of those things, like you mentioned, does have does have a value attached. You mentioned that your first Instagram deal was when you had 5,000 followers. What's interesting to me is your first TikTok deal was in 2020 when you had 45,000 followers, but it was for $2,000 instead of 5,000, even though uh, if I do the quick math, what is that? Like you had nine times the reach or following on TikTok at the time. Do you see that as a typical um, trend between TikTok and Instagram? Do you find that brands are more willing to pay for assets on Instagram versus TikTok? And if so, why do you think that is? Yeah. So the short answer is yes. Uh, my Instagram, you know, I, I think that I like that you brought in the, that 2020 deal because I was like, man, after 2019, I really, you know, had a discount. So, you know, TikTok was an interesting case study for me because I grew from 700 followers in July of 2020. I think that's when I started tracking it to 45,000 in a month. And that was attributed to one viral post, which then made all of the other posts viral. And at the time, and probably still, TikTok is so fun to me. I'm not really going there. You know, sometimes I get a little bit nervous because I do a lot of corporate engagements as well. And I'm like, I wonder if one of my corporate partners like saw my TikTok, what they would think. But then I'm like, I actually advocate for bringing your full authentic self, but not just to one place. So mm -hmm. I think it's sprinkled across a lot of different places. And I'm like, that's where that side of my authentic self shows up. So I think on TikTok, you know, I think what was interesting was when I got that deal or when I got the, the invitation, I had 45,000 followers and I reached out to a couple other TikTok friends and they all told me, they were like, yeah, 200 to $500 is good. And I was like, but I have so many followers. Um, but, and so 2000 actually felt good to me. And I even think I, I yeah, I, I, this is a longer version. I, I think on Instagram, it's a stickier audience. Mm -hmm. So before the introduction of reels, and actually I'm noticing that reels now are going more to my followers rather than just being sent to the explore page first. While TikTok will experiment with sending your content to the For You page, see how it performs there, and actually a good performing post on TikTok will have the majority of engagement happen from the For You side. Right. I think it's a lot easier. I wanted to knock on wood. It's a, it's a little bit easier, or at least it feels like to me, to get a follower on TikTok than it is to get a follower on Instagram. So even now, after having invested, you know, what is it, four years since that first brand deal on Instagram, I now have 29,000 followers. That's, mm -hmm. you know, it would be amazing. Actually, I did have one friend 
who grew from 50,000 when I first met her. And now she has over 400,000. So maybe she's doing something a l- more right than I am. Um, <laughs> versus on TikTok right now, I have about 118,000 followers. So it's still, mm-hmm. it seems big, but I feel like I have more engagement and actually better views on Instagram. And sometimes I'll post the same exact content on TikTok and on Instagram, and it'll do much better on Instagram. And I actually think that's because I did a much better job of curating my audience on Instagram to know that if you follow my page, it's going to be disability advocacy content. I talk about anti-Asian hate. Um, I, I just talk about like my life as an advocate through my lens. Versus I think on TikTok, because I have de-niched myself, they're still trying to figure out like who should get my content. Yeah. No, you brought up so many great points. TikTok is amazing for discoverability. I am not active on TikTok enough to really give my opinion on the, the level of relationship built with your followers compared to other platforms. But it does seem from b- both what you said and what many of my friends who are active on both platforms tend to agree with is that they have closer, deeper relationships with their Instagram followers versus TikTok followers, but they use TikTok as a discoverability channel. I will also share that I got a piece of advice from a another creator who I think has like 25 million followers across platforms. So, so a little, a little larger than mine. (laughs) And he, and he actually said, he said, Tiffany, if you want to go viral, create on TikTok. If you want to create a career as a content creator, create on YouTube. Mm. Uh, And I'm not, I'm not super active on YouTube, but I'm becoming more active on there. But I am realizing that TikTok helped me explode my platform and my advocacy and also made me believe that I was a creator but I still think that the majority of where brands or you know other content programs are seeing value is on some of these other platforms. Like LinkedIn is actually my quickest growing platform right now. Um, and I'm still getting the majority of my deals through Instagram, but maybe wanting a cross post to TikTok. Yeah. And I, I'm so glad you brought up LinkedIn too, because I have it on in my notes to ask you about that. Actually, when we kind of break down your different revenue streams in your side hustle content creation business, I just realized as I'm speaking with you that earlier when you mentioned a uh, resource, Clara for creators, um, I meant to pull that out for our listeners in case, because I, I, I said I knew what it was, but I realized not all of our listeners do. So just in case you caught that moment earlier, Tiffany did mention Clara for Creators. I think it's been described like a glass door for content creators. So you know, if you go on Glassdoor, you're able to see reviews from employees at companies on the work culture, leadership, et cetera. Clara's like that, but it's uh, creators reviewing their relationships or their experiences working with brands, how much brands typically pay, how their communication style was, et cetera. So it's a really great, I believe, free resource that you can look into. So just Google Clara for creators. There's also a new one that's emerged on the scene that's gotten a lot of um, media. This is a clean podcast, so I won't <laughs> I won't say the actual expletive, but it's F U pay me with the actual, you know, word. And that one is is pretty awesome too. It's it's all crowdsourced data. And so again, if you're new to this world and you're just kind of curious, what do people on different platforms at different uh, audience sizes for different deliverables actually charge? You can look at those two sources for some of that data. So um, just wanted to quickly bring that point up. But let's talk real quick about your actual split. So the numbers for those of you listening, and again, for reference, in a single year, Tiffany made over $100,000 as a content creator, as a side hustle. And this is not including any of the revenue or work that um, she does with Diversability, her her main company. But this is what the split looked like. It was 60% brand partnership. So $60,935 came in from brand partnerships, 35% of the revenue came in from creator programs. That includes programs such as LinkedIn creator program, the Reels bonuses, payouts, and the TikTok creator fund. So that totaled $38,027. By the way, I just have to interject and say, when you sent over this info, Tiffany, I was like, oh, this is a person after my own heart. You actually gave (laughs) such deep... like. On some of these, you actually gave the, the to the cent, like the penny. And I was like, no one ever does that. I mean... 
I do that on my income reports, but like no one I've ever interviewed has done that to that level. I will say I'm, and yeah, it's in, it's in a spreadsheet. <laughs> this is this is where my finance my finance degree is coming. I am so appreciative, and I know our listeners are too. That level of transparency is rare, so I appreciate you. Um, anyways, and then the final split is five percent from UGC content, which if that term is unfamiliar to you, we can dive into it a little bit more. But it stands for user generated content, and that amounted to six thousand. $981. So I figure, Tiffany, you and I could go through each of these one by one and kind of break them down. We've obviously already started talking about um, brand partnerships. So I'm actually going to skip over to creator funds and maybe circle back to brand partnerships at the end to recap. But for creator funds, uh, I have actually never heard of LinkedIn creator program. Can you tell us a little bit more about that one? Yeah. So I was, um, I also wanted to share with your audience that I did create a TikTok a couple of months ago around uh, the breakdown of how much money actually hit my bank account. Mm -hmm. And it ranged from $107.80 in July, uh, up this of 2022. Um, and then on the high end in April of 2022, I got $27,482.97. What? Wow. What a dis what a disparity in terms of range. Yeah. <laughs> I know. And and so that's why, you know, someone came back and they asked me, they were like, hey, how do you manage with such volatile amounts coming in? And I said, because I am doing this on the side. Like I have other places that I know I can make rent, you know, other ways I'm generating income as well. So also a plug to, to diversify your streams of income. I think that's something I, I learned at, as an early age, going to garage sales with my dad and learning all the different ways that you could sell things and resell things. Um, but LinkedIn, yeah, it was called the LinkedIn Creator Accelerator Program. I was actually in their inaugural class. They've done a couple since then. I think they've done either one or two other US cohorts since then. But LinkedIn started their LinkedIn for Creators page maybe like less than two years ago. Interesting. I, I do remember a year after they launched their LinkedIn for Creators page, it was at a million followers. So wow. so that that was, I don't know, all the months are blurring into the same month. So the program was really focused on accelerating you on LinkedIn. And so every person who applied needed to apply with a LinkedIn-related project. So my project was I want to do a 10-part LinkedIn Live series called Disability Employment Works. And I remember, Ellen, when I reached out to your team about some some ideas, I was like, ooh, maybe I can talk about my LinkedIn project. So here, this is me talking about my LinkedIn project. But in addition to that, uh, they awarded us around fifteen to $20,000. So I want to say this is a pretty large amount of money. Um, but mm -hmm. I will say I have been part of a couple other creator programs that are are trying to be competitive as well. So I was in another one that paid $7,500. I was in one that paid maybe $1,500 to $2,000, different platforms. I won't name the names. But again, I think that all of these different platforms are now seeing the value of creators creating content. And what's been interesting about my own journey on LinkedIn was that when I first started on LinkedIn, this is before I saw myself as a creator, I just saw LinkedIn as the professional platform where you just share your professional accolades. Mm -hmm. Now it's a place that you go and this is what they really want to stress. It's a place where you spark conversations, where you have conversations around work. And the thing is, what I learned is that I can't compartmentalize different aspects of my identity. You know, we just surpassed the second anniversary of the Atlanta spa shooting. I'm Asian. You're Asian. Like, it's hard coming across these dates and how we show up in the workplace as well. So some of those conversations are showing up and, and people will even come into the comments sometimes and be like, this isn't LinkedIn content, um, even though it goes viral, which means that it is resonating with people yeah. in one way or another. And they want to talk about these things. And one of the things I've noticed is that anytime I've talked about mental health on LinkedIn, you know, I mentioned mm -hmm. an experience I had where I got triggered and what I wish would have happened or things to do instead, those actually get the most engagement for me, which I found surprising. But then as I thought about it, I'm like, we we have so much work to do to still remove the stigma around mental health. And mm -hmm. so many people, I think, are thirsty to be talking about this. But that was long-winded, but I wanted to share it. So there were some posting requirements uh, related to the program. It was 10 weeks. It happened from January to March of 2022. But 
to receive fifteen to twenty thousand dollars to create some LinkedIn posts. That was that was pretty incredible. That is incredible. And it operates. I'm so glad I asked you about this. It wasn't long winded at all, by the way. I feel like every detail you gave was extremely helpful for context and context reigns queen over here on our show. So I find it interesting that LinkedIn almost instead of the typical creator fund that let's say TikTok and Instagram have where they pay you based on, you know, impressions and and they kind of assign you this arbitrary like you get x amount of dollars if you hit 10 million views in 30 days or whatever it is. It seems like LinkedIn kind of takes more of that approach of being a partner with you by investing in your business and saying, we will pay you X amount of dollars to create the content regardless of its performance because we believe this content matters. Mm. And that to me is, I I personally very much resonate with that approach. And so I'll I'll definitely be checking out that program. Yeah, definitely check it out. I will say the second cohort was focused very specifically on technology and innovation. And the projects that people proposed were very different. Some people proposed like, hey, I'm going to do a series of LinkedIn audio rooms, or I'm going to launch a newsletter, or I'm going to, you know, and so actually one, one little gripe I had was that they came to us and we had all these posting requirements every week that were unrelated to the project that we pitched, but we still needed to do our project. So it was almost like in addition to keeping up with, with all the posts, I also had to make sure that every single week I was I was doing the the project that I had pitched. But yeah, it I will say that part of what I love about these creator programs, not necessarily the reels bonuses, you know, or the creator fund, um, but part of what I love about being in these creator programs is actually getting to meet other creators. I actually think that is worth more than twenty thousand dollars to me. Some of my fellow creators, one of them is an, and now a New York Times best selling illustrator for Jimmy Fallon and Jennifer Lopez's book. And another person has like three or four million followers on TikTok. And another one is writing a book about personal finance for first gen folks. And, And they're not in my niche, right? They're not all disability advocates. And it just introduces me to, hey, there are a lot of other people who are creating value add content, even your podcast, creating great content out there that is outside of my world that I wanna be aware of too. Yeah, I could not agree with you more that, I mean, and this extends beyond even creator programs. I think your philosophy or approach to this is applicable to really any sort of program that either invests in you or you invest in, right? Whether you're joining, paying, let's say, to join a program or whether you're part of a creator program where the the company's actually investing in you. I always think it's the peers that you meet that actually have the largest impact on not just your business trajectory, but really your life's experience. And so um, I'm really glad that you added in that extra element as a reminder to all of us that it's not even about who's leading the program, in this case, LinkedIn. It's about the people who are in the room with you. So I love that approach. You mentioned just a moment ago Reels bonuses, and it's it's funny the timing of our conversation, right? Because as we're recording this in real time, it's the spring of 2023, and Instagram just announced that they are canceling all Reels bonus payouts for the foreseeable future. So I'd love to get your hot take on this, Tiffany. What was your initial reaction when, when the news broke on this? Uh, do you think this is for the good in the long run? Are you personally upset about this? Does this shift your strategy at all in terms of where you spend your time? I'm just curious your hot take on it. Yeah, I will say in full transparency, I was a little bummed. I will say Facebook Reels bonuses, I just have not cracked that. I've probably made like $15 total. Um, But again, you know, daughter of Asian immigrants, garage sales, like $15 is $15 and a bunch of $15 together creates $100, $1,000. Um, And probably through Reels, I was probably bringing in about a little more than $100 every month. So I I wasn't crushing it out of the park, but they would renew. I would get the invite to renew every month. Yeah. And um, yeah. And with the current economic climate, I I recently got interviewed for a, a piece in The Observer about whether or not we as creators were nervous about how we would do for this year with inflation and interest rates and potential economy and banks going under, you know, like, uh, so, so yeah, I, is it going to change my strategy? 
I will say that the only reason I was posting on Facebook Reels was that bonus program was for that fifteen dollars. I feel like your listeners will laugh, but um, but <laughs> but, but the fifteen dollars do add up. And I was hoping maybe one of them would go really viral or something. Um, but I think it's part of a broader like cross posting strategy for me. So where all of my kind of like native short form video content sits is on TikTok. Mm. One piece of advice I've gotten is that if you want to grow on YouTube, unless you're a really well-established long form creator, one of the best ways to grow is through shorts. I don't, I don't know. Ellen, do you have a shorts, a, a YouTube short strategy? Uh, we, so we actually made YouTube a large focus for us this year. It's funny you bring that up. And it's, I actually meant to comment on what you had shared earlier, that friend who gave you the advice of if you want a long-term career as a creator to focus on YouTube, that's such an interesting perspective. And I, I, I agree not only from the perspective of being a content creator, but also just even thinking back to my own habits as a content consumer. I mean, YouTube was really the first platform as a middle school kid where I was watching and spending a lot of my time. And what I find so interesting about YouTube is in surveys, they've shown that even with the huge popularity of TikTok among younger generations, especially Gen Z and Gen Alpha, they still found that the percentage of time that Gen Z spends online, there's still a larger majority who spend time on YouTube than TikTok, even though YouTube is decades older as a platform. And so I, I don't have a, a specific short strategy right now, although I am planning to hire a consultant to help us with that in the spring. But what what we are doing right now is exactly what you said. We have our native short form content mostly created for Instagram, but then we're repurposing just straight up, like without the watermark, reposting onto YouTube and just making sure that the title is kind of geared toward a YouTube viewer. And it's done so well to grow our our viewership and our um our subscriber count on YouTube even though we're a small YouTube channel under a thousand but without shorts I don't think we would be anywhere near the growth we are at this point. Yeah. So yeah, I think to answer your question, I'm I'm curious where, you know, Meta as a whole is going to decide those bonuses. Money is incentivizing. <laughs> you know, I I think I'd be remiss I if I your honesty. <laughs> you know, like um but but yeah, I'm a little I, I'm curious to see what happens, but I I don't have plans to change my current posting strategy. It works for me. I yeah. will say similar to you, it's it is a lot of reposting, um, but it's easy to do and and I don't mind doing it. Absolutely. So I guess that leaves us. You talked about LinkedIn, we talked about Instagram. That leaves us with the TikTok creator fund. I mean, when we're looking at the numbers, if you're looking at thirty eight thousand total came from all creator programs, and we already know about fifteen to twenty thousand was attributed to LinkedIn. So I'm assuming that TikTok, you made more money from TikTok than you did Instagram in within that category. Am I correct in that assumption? That is correct. I was also in a. So I will share. Okay, so hold on, let me see. Looking at my spreadsheet. So yeah, so now you know about fifteen to twenty k of that came from the LinkedIn program. I was in another creator program that was off platform that paid 15K. For TikTok? Or you mean for? So it wasn't hosted by TikTok, but it was for TikTok content. Got it. Okay. Yes. So, so I will say that there are also programs, creator programs outside of the platforms. And, and again, like I'm what, what you would call like a creator educator. And I think we're seeing a lot more content now around how creator educators might win through this current economic climate. Um, but a lot of my content is about ed educating people. So I'm doing a lot of, at least for that other creator program that I was in, I was doing a lot of research around the history of different laws or, or different things that exist in, in disability. And, and everything was researched with sources. And actually, I try to do that with a lot of my like broader disability advocacy things. Um, but yeah, that was a TikTok program. And then I, I will say part of why I continue to post on TikTok as like my main short form video content is it is the only platform that I have had a what's called a managed creator. So mm -hmm. what that means is that if you have a large enough platform or the social media platform, actually, I've had one on LinkedIn too. Sorry. So uh, but TikTok was first. So if you have a large enough platform or they think your content is valuable enough 
uh, you will get a dedicated rep who works at that company who's there to help you ensure that you are successful on that platform. So what I have heard is that from a YouTube perspective, there are some YouTube managers who go and look for big TikTokers and see if they can bring them over to YouTube. So that's an example of kind of, and and actually I think in the LinkedIn program that I did, they actually brought on some people who had large followings on other platforms and brought them into this creator program so that they could start to build their platform on LinkedIn. Interesting. Okay. I didn't even, again, things that I'm not aware of because I'm not active on TikTok. I'm just kind of like a lurker on that. No, but but Instagram has managed creators. Facebook, you could have a managed creator. I just don't, YouTube has managed creators. And effectively, they're not really doing that much. Or actually they do a lot. Sorry. I I don't want to put shade on the, the creator managers, but what they do do is they make you feel like you're important. (laughs) Yeah. I mean, it, it, it's hard to get direct access to any social platforms, customer service. And so to your point, having a direct line of contact does really help simplify and make things convenient on, on the occasions where issues do arise. Yes. Um, and, I, and I will say there have been three instances. Uh, the first one was someone made a comment. So as I mentioned, my arm is paralyzed. I get a lot of comments from people saying, you should just cut off your arm. It's useless. Uh, and I see, I saw Ellen's reaction there. If you're watching the video yeah. as a, su- a surprise, but I get comments like that a lot. And so I recorded a response video saying, Hey, like, don't call anyone's body that because like, here are the things that I do use my arm for, even though it is limited mobility, but I tried to make it funny. So I included a picture of a knife when I was reading someone's <laughs> comment to me and that was seen as, as violence. Violent, and, yeah. Yeah. And so, um, and so that was flagged and I went through my creator manager and we found a way to repost it that didn't have that. Um, and something like that has happened a couple of times. And so I think this actually does lead to another lesson around kind of being marketable is that I try to make my content like family friendly. I don't know, is disability, ad- it should be family friendly. But um, mm-hmm. e- even though it's advocacy and it could be seen as as po- our existence is political, you know, so, um, but I want to do it in a way that's educational and that's fun and doesn't shame anyone. Like, like one of the things that I've learned uh, and that I repeat is that learning should never be about shame. Mm, and so yeah. there are some TikTok creators who have gotten really big because all they do is put other people on blast for things that they've said. And I will say, I go back and I watch some of my old speaking videos sometimes, and I've used outdated language. And I've actually taken clips of those and made stitches and said, hey, I'm learning. I used to describe my disability as my funny hand. And I'm like, I have learned because it it gave permission for other people to describe my body that way. And I would never describe other people's bodies as as funny. So yeah, it's like learning is never about shame, but also my content is always through that lens of, hey, I'm learning and I want you to learn alongside me too. And I think some of the brands that I've gotten to work with and even some of these creator programs that I've been in have also seen that too and say, hey, you're sharing this educational content. You have your research and your sources cited. We know that you can't single-handedly dismantle the system of oppression that is ableism, but we want to support you by providing you some funds because we know that historically and systemically, you and the communities that you represent have been underpaid, underemployed, unemployed, not even paid, a lot of free labor. So I... I, yeah, you are totally right. I'm still sitting here a little bit in shock that someone would say to any other human that if, you know, that if their body part isn't working the way that, you know, it, they think it should, that it it should be cut off. That's, that's just absolutely wild (laughs) to me that someone would even think to say that the, the words that come out of people's mouths when they're behind the shield of a screen is, is always astonishing to me. Um, but I really, really appreciate your approach on never tying shame with learning. And I think that is so comforting and really brings in more people to the work that you care about, to your advocacy, because I think shame is a reason a lot of people stay away from learning about things that are uncomfortable because they don't want to have to look themselves in the mirror and go, oh, am I now a bad person or am I a horrible human being because I've done these things in the past that I just wasn't aware of? Um, So I think your open door 
um, approach to like, hey, come join the conversation. I'm not perfect either. We're all learning alongside each other is just such a beautiful approach to education. So I really appreciate that personally. One last thought here on uh, creator funds before we move into UGC, because that's actually a topic we've never broached on the podcast. So I, of course, have to ask you about it. Um, But if you are listening to this episode right now and you're like, oh my goodness, I didn't even know all these different type of creator programs and creator funds and all these things even existed, um, I actually gave a month by month recap of exactly what Instagram paid me last year when I had 29,000 followers on Instagram. Um, broke that down and then kind of gave my overarching uh, thoughts on creator funds as a whole and how that fits into your business plan as an entrepreneur uniquely. So if you're curious about that, that was a bonus episode on the podcast. We'll make sure to link it in the show notes below. You can scroll below and listen to that if you want to further partake in this conversation. But let's move into, Tiffany, for you, your third category of how you make money as a content creator on the side. And that is UGC, user-generated content. You call it features. For those who don't understand what UGC is, can you define that first and then talk about how you're doing that work with brands? Yeah. So I call it features because some parts are UGC, but I got paid $10,000 because someone wanted to use my picture on their social media page. That doesn't feel like UGC to me. And they made all of the content or the marketing agency did. It was just like, hey, we like what you're about. I mean, And I think I also want to highlight that I have a feeling that some parts of this might feel like unrelatable or unattainable, but I spent a lot of time building up what I stood for. Mm-hmm. And I think that now, you know, I call myself like a 14-year overnight success story. Like this, <laughs> this did not happen randomly. I spent many, many years actually sharing the same things in person that I share now on social media. And on social media, people are like, wow, I had no idea this is the first time I'm I'm ever hearing this. And I think back and I'm like, in 2009, I had said this and you can go find this article. But I have to remind myself, I call this like the reset, like every conversation I have, every person who sees my content for the first time, like you said, context just wins. I need to provide context. I need to, you know, keep it as uh, approachable and um, and digestible as possible. Right. But yeah, coming back to the features. So, so yeah, it's a combination of UGC, but it doesn't feel like UGC to me. I don't know. I don't know. I get what you're saying because essentially, like in the example you just gave, if someone's in essence licensing your photo or your image, they're really paying for name image likeness, right? They're paying for the ability to slap your face on their content with your permission, of course, and and to use your image or the credibility you've built up if someone comes across whatever content they've created and they associate it with you and your brand. In, In the very same way that I guess for our listeners, the way I would associate this with like a more um common real life analogy is an athlete, let's say, uh, being on a cereal box, right? It's that kind of unofficial or or official, in this case, endorsement um, of that athlete saying, yes, you can use my name image likeness on this brand or for this content. And I'm giving you permission to associate my, my personality, my brand, my credibility with whatever you're creating. So I get what you're saying. Features is different from UGC. So I guess- Yeah. I mean, there is, I think there- Hold on, let me see. I think there was only three like UGC type deals where it was, I, I still have to make all the content, but it never needs to show up on my channels. Mm-hmm. I will say a lot of people are finding their way into content creation and into monetizing as a content creator. I don't think that this is your target audience though, could be, um, which is maybe you haven't. So what you were saying before about the athlete, to me, what the $10,000 was, was my personal brand equity. That's like the best way I understand is that they saw value in Tiffany U equity (laughs) and wanted that on their feed. Versus for UGC, I don't think that they would have cared if it was Tiffany or, I mean, I don't want to use care, care or not care, but it could have been anyone. And they mm-hmm. had a flat rate. But I will say for the for the three pieces of UGC that I did do, one was one was around showcasing how I create content as someone who has an upper extremity disability. So that was specific to me. 
One was more mental health related and wanting to learn more about my mental health journey. And, and I have a very specific journey there as well. And I can't remember the last one. But but again, I think there's some personal brand equity in those as well, which, which is why they didn't feel exactly like UGC, because a lot of UGC is like, let, let me show you this this product and you don't see my face, you know. Um, but but yeah, I don't know. Have you have you ventured into UGC? I have not before, um, personally. And I love the way you phrased personal brand equity, by the way. That's such a great term because yes, they are buying into your already established brand and credibility, and that's why they're, you know, using your your image or your likeness. Um, but to clarify for any of our listeners who may have not experienced UGC or been part of this world, like Tiffany said, essentially UGC is, let's say you're an amazing videographer and you create really amazing creative, right? Actual content. But let's say you yourself have no audience or a very small audience or a personal brand that doesn't have a lot of equity built up in it yet, meaning a lot of resonance or influence or whatever you want to call it. And so maybe a brand comes across, let's say you, I don't know, (laughs) this is a silly example, but let's say you made this amazing video about your morning coffee routine and you use a Keurig in it, let's say, and Keurig comes across this video and they're like, oh my goodness, this is amazing. We want to use this video in our ads. In this case, if they decided to ask you for the usage rights to that video, or if they asked you to create a brand new video, let's say with some of their new line of products coming out, and you create that content and then give it to them, and they distribute and publish it on Keurig's channels, at that point, it's UGC because you are only in charge of creating the content and giving the brand the ability to use it. You yourself are not publishing, posting, or distributing this content on your own own channel. So you're not sharing it with your audience. You're not putting it in your email. Um, You're just in charge of creation, not distribution. And so that's kind of like the way I think about UGC. And Tiffany, if you have anything to add there, feel free to jump in. (laughs) But that's kind of... So the other thing I kind of keep in mind, which is tied into my pricing, is that my arm is paralyzed. I don't know how you make content, Ellen, but a lot of it is on the phone. It's filming things. And I and I film most things by myself with my tripod. Um, yeah. And it's getting creative about all the different angles and, and stuff like that. And so I also, I, I take that into account. I'm like, I'm a part-time creator. What is the threshold to me price-wise for me willing to do this? If it's video content, that's going to require a little bit more. And so you know, sometimes I'll have brands and they'll say, well, other creators that you're following are charging this. And then I'm like, well, that's great. That's that, that's them. That's what they're willing to do this for. And this is what I'm willing to do it for. So I advocate for this thing because I know you asked about pricing and I didn't give you a direct answer. I call it pressure testing your pricing. So, I mean, you could go out and say, well, my price is $10,000, but if no one has paid you that yet, then maybe you need to pressure test and see for the brands that you really want to work with, like where where are you landing? And so the fact that at 5,000 Instagram followers and 5,000 Twitter followers, I charged $5,000 and that's what they paid me, then I was like, ooh, maybe the next time I'm going to charge 8,000 or the next time I'm going to charge 10,000. And that's kind of how, how I've personally navigated it. To me, it's been less about the followers. And again, Ellen, I come back to this like personal brand equity the fact that like as you continue to invest in your personal brand, you're going to build equity there, whether that's going on a bunch of podcasts like this or creating your own content or getting featured or doing speaking. Like the more people who know what you're about, the more equity you're going to build. And there's a price associated with that equity as well. 100%. To your point, it's the difference between if you, Tiffany, speak about something versus a random person on the street saying the exact same words, but without having built up that brand equity, it lands different, right? People will pay attention or take action differently depending on who the the carrier of the message is. So <laughs> I, I really love that you um, emphasize that point. I want to circle back to wrap up this case study with the brand partnerships piece, a lot of our listeners are, I mean, I'm sure a section of our listeners are content creators full-time or consider themselves influencers full-time where content creation is their entire business. 
We also have a few fellow media companies like ourselves who are podcasters, newsletter creators, blogs, whatnot. But for the most part, I would say our audience is running either an online or in-person business um, that sells a product or service that is not based on selling content as the actual product, but rather using content as a marketing channel for their actual products and services. So I'm sure you've intrigued a lot of minds today in hearing, oh, okay, so like I didn't even know that as the leader or founder or face of my company, I could also create an income stream as a content creator. What would be your best advice for if someone has never done a brand deal before and they're just thinking about how they can make that first deal happen as a part-time content creator like yourself, where where would you suggest they start today? Yeah. So I feel like we didn't even talk about pitching because <laughs> that, uh, although I think that's probably a big part of it. So what I usually recommend, because when I posted, when I posted that TikTok where I shared that I made $100 one month and then $27,000 another month, I got a lot of questions. And I got actually a lot of questions from friends who have millions more followers than I have mm. and have never done a brand deal, did not even know, don't even know where to start. So if you don't know where to start, what I have usually told people is there are three things you can do. Number one is you need to let people know that you're open to doing brand deals. So if you go to my personal website, tiffanyu.com, you can see a section called partnerships. And it may be a little outdated, but I have a couple examples of brand partnerships that I've done in the past. Mm -hmm. So then when anyone goes to my website, they know, okay, we can hire Tiffany to speak. We can hire her for one-on-one -on -one work. We can hire her to do brand partnerships. And for my friends who have millions of followers, they don't even have their email address on their uh, anywhere that I can find it. And then when I go to their link in bio, it's like to their business, which was like a construction company. But again, nothing pointing to if a brand is interested in reaching out, they don't even know where to go. So that's number one is, you know, and I think you'll see in some people's Instagram bios, they'll put like brand slash collabs and then an email. Yeah. But now there's like a little place where you can just have an email button on there. Um, but also so if people don't can't find the email, maybe they'll DM you as well. So that's number one. Number two is if you are interested in doing more brand partnerships, you know, I will say in full transparency that I don't like that 65% of my creator income, like the majority of it is coming from brand partnerships because those budgets are changing all the time and can be inconsistent. There are something called influencer marketplaces that you can go to. And a couple of the ones that I have successfully used, one is called Obviously. And their rates, you know, sometimes I've seen $2,000 brand deals come in. Uh, I don't know how they figure out the the pricing if it's depending on your followership or other things. Um, and then I think you can go in and pitch what your rate is to. Aspire IQ is another one that I have personally used. Um, there are so many out there, like too many, <laughs> which also means that there are a lot of brands that are looking for creators to work with. Mm -hmm. It might be lower dollar amounts in the beginning, but you just want to have those first couple of case studies in the beginning that you can put together. So I actually don't have a media kit. So I can't, you know, you can talk to other creators who say a media kit is required. It shows what type of content you create, where you've been featured, all your metrics, blah, blah, blah. I don't have one. So uh, I, I don't know if I'm the best person to follow, but what the influencer marketplaces will help you do though also is they'll let you know what brands have worked with creators before or have worked with influencers before so that even if you don't do something on platform, maybe you can reach out to them on the side and say, hey, like I've seen that you've worked with creators before. Here's the type of content that I create. Here's my idea for how we can potentially work together. Would you be interested? So that was kind of like number two. I just want to add a quick comment on obviously, since that's an influencer marketplace, I have used another one in college that I was familiar with is Influencer. Um, again, we'll put these names down below in the show notes if you want to know the spellings. But it's to Tiffany's point, I think it's a great starting place to reverse engineer and find out what brands have budgets in the first place. But also, like Tiffany said, to build up your portfolio of 
brands you've worked with or case studies because it's always going to be easier for the next brand to say yes than the first brand to say yes. So it's a great way to build up that portfolio. That said, I will say if you have a micro audience, so anything really under 100,000 on a platform, it, in my opinion, pays pennies compared to the value that you can actually broker and negotiate on your own if you pitch your own brand deals. So I almost never go through those marketplaces anymore for actual partnerships, but it is a great starting point to just get the first one or two under your belt so that you even understand the process of what it looks like to work with a brain because that's a whole learning curve that if you've never done that before, um, you you have to kind of learn the language of this industry, right? And you're going to have to learn what that process looks like, what creative approvals look like, what talking with a brand rep looks like. So it's a good way to accelerate your you're learning while getting paid for it. That's kind of how I would think about it instead of trying to utilize it as a revenue generator from the get-go. Correct. I would say use the influencer marketplaces as the starting point so that you can get a couple of brands under your belt, If again, if you're new. And then after a certain point in time, brands will know that this is something that you do and maybe they'll reach out to you or you can reach out to them. And I remembered my third, yes, which was... You want to be creating the type of content that a brand could see themselves in. Mm. So I will say that if you go to my feed, um, and and some will recommend that you don't do this, but sometimes if you go to some people's feed and you click on who's tagged, they will tag like every single thing that they're wearing. And some people will say, don't do that because you're giving the brand free exposure. But what it does now, especially on Instagram, it goes into their inbox Their social media manager sees it. They see that you already love the brand. And I will say I have had a couple of inquiries. I don't know if any of them have turned into deals yet, Uh, but I have had a couple of brands that I love that we've created like a parasocial relationship on social media because I love their shoes or their jacket I wear all the time or their backpack is the only one that I travel with or this microphone I use on all my podcasts, you know, so... Because if you think about doing a deal, like I think about that first $5,000 deal in 2019, you could not tell that was an ad. I mean, even though there was hashtag ad in it, you know, and you got to make sure you include all those disclosures, but it was so aligned with what I was already posting about. Versus if you are someone who, you know, usually posts, I don't know, about sneakers, and then all of a sudden I see you, I don't know, doing an ad for a vacuum cleaner. I don't I don't know. I was just thinking out, looking at like what was, or for a trash can or something. As someone who follows you, I'm just going to be like, what happened here? And the brand also wants to make sure that there's consistency in what you're posting so that not only does it like not feel like an ad, even though you have all the disclosures on there, they know that your audience is used to like, oh, Tiffany just asked me to sign this thing for diversity and inclusion. And that's everything that she talks about on her channel. I'm going to sign this thing. And, uh, and and so that was kind of my third, my third piece of advice. I wanted to share a quick case study, though, about pricing, oh. which I think will help illuminate some things. So one of these marketplaces actually reached out to me and said, hey, we want you to work on this campaign. And we're going to pay you, based on your following, $400 for two reels. Again, full disclosure, I have a rep now, so I forwarded over to my rep, even though I would have done this part of the negotiation myself, but I wouldn't have known how to like itemize all the different things. And that's what I think a rep is is actually good for, because I, I still would not be the expert to talk to you about all the different aspects of a deal. But we negotiated that deal up to one reel for $3,500. Wow. So before it was one reel for $200, right? And they wanted to to one for $3,500. Keep in mind that years ago, I got paid for a couple Instagram posts and tweets for $5,000, right? So it also made me wonder who accepted that for 400, for the two reels for $400. -hmm. And, and it just goes to show there's huge discrepancy. You know, even if you go on to Clara for creators or some of the other resources and you look at people's followership, I mean, there are some people who have millions of followers who charge like $17,000 per deal, right? I think maybe that's the dream for some of us because then you only have to do a couple big deals per year. But I wanted to share that, that always ask if there's room in the budget. If they say no, 
and you still want to do it at $400 because you really care about it and it's brand aligned, then that's your decision. I will say I have had a couple brands, like I'll share my rates and they're like, whoa, that's way out of our budget. We both have to be okay walking away. So it's it's a little bit of a game, the negotiation. But I also think that I'm now in a place where I make a lot less branded content and get paid at higher rates, which is helpful for me and my disability and my lifestyle and also running my business. 100%. And I think it circles back to the thing you said at the very beginning of our conversation, which is you have to evaluate every allocation of your time and your energy and your resources as an opportunity cost. If you say yes to creating these two reels, what is it taking away from with your advocacy work? What is it taking away from from your home life? What is it taking away from I don't know, your you time just to be with yourself. And and all of those things have value and different priorities for different people. So depending on the season of your life or business, you may find yourself more likely to say yes for certain things versus other times. And I think you just have to have clarity on what your own North Star is. And as long as you have that, it makes it much easier for you to be able to be in those negotiations with confidence and be able to walk away with, with confidence if it doesn't end up being an aligned fit. So Tiffany, I am, again, just so grateful for all of your transparency today and especially the 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 level of detail that you shared in terms of dollar amounts and your own case studies um i wish we had extra time to talk more about your advocacy i know work. it's it's a it's a pivot yeah. although i will say i haven't had an opportunity to get to talk about this side of my multi hyphenate life so I'm really, you can go listen to other podcasts for the disability advocacy stuff. You're amazing. Well, if there's a favorite one or two interviews in the past that you feel like our listeners should start with, feel free to email that over and we'll put it in the show notes so that they have a starting place. But last thing, what is the best place for people to continue to follow your work, connect with you and engage in the advocacy work that you do for people with disabilities? Sure. So you can follow me, tiffanyu.com. We'll have all links to my social channels, but I'm at I'm Tiffany U across social channels. That's the letter I, the letter M, followed by my first and last name. And then if you're interested in more like disability, like super just dis- because I talk about all different types of things in my channels, uh, diversability we have, and you'll notice our brands are very different too. I think that's something that has been important to me. Um, but if you're focused on disability allyship, like getting a more more choir of voices in terms of your own education, you can follow diversability across social channels as well. Amazing. Thank you so much for your time today.